Now that we have proven where BC3 is, I've drawn a very careful diagram illustrating the situation. We started out with BC1 with no taxes. Then we went to BC2, the specific taxes. And on BC2, the consumer decided to go to X2 and Y2 because that was the utility maximizing point given BC2 and BC2's affordable set. The reason X2, Y2 was the maximizing point is because uh, BC BC2 was able, uh, X2, Y2 was able to achieve a utility level of U2. So U2 is the highest indifference curve which the consumer facing BC2 can achieve. And there's a tangency between U2 and BC2 at X2, Y2. So U, U2, which is represented by this contour line, is tangent to BC2 which is represented by this budget constraint. So there's the tangency. What I showed in the last lesson is that BC3, the lump sum tax, passes through X2, Y2. We already knew that BC3 was parallel to BC1. So now I've drawn here a careful diagram where BC3, BC3 has been moved in a parallel fashion down from BC1 until it passes through x2, y2. We have this diagram because we impose the condition on that the revenue earned by the government from BC3 and BC2 are exactly the same. In other words, the lump sum tax and the specific tax are exactly the same. So now we can ask the question, the government doesn't care which of these two it imposes because the revenue is exactly the same. Well, does anybody else care? And the answer is yes. And you can see now with this diagram why that's the case. If you were this consumer and you were given a choice between BC2 and BC3, which would you pick? Well, the point is that if you face BC3, you could achieve, let's say, this utility level. You could be on an indifference, an indifference curve that looked like that. You could be here. And that, I'll call it U3, U3 is bigger than U2. It corresponds to a, a larger amount of utility than U2. You can see that because U, U3 lies above and to the right of U2. And U3 is achievable at the point I've indicated with, the, with this, uh, this double circle. Let me do one more circle here. So it's a triple circle. U3 is achievable on the lump, under the lump sum tax. It's achievable on BC3, whereas on BC2 it's not achievable. So the result is that the consumer would prefer facing BC3 to facing U2. In other words, would cons prefer facing the lump sum tax to the specific tax, because even though the amount of money that he's going to pay to the government is exactly the same under these two, by not having to face a twisted budget constraint, which is what he'd have to face under BC2, he's, he's able to achieve a higher level of utility. So what we conclude is the superiority of lump sum taxes. And that's what, I, what we meant by the lump sum tax principle. Now, I also mentioned that in the real world, we don't actually have any lump sum taxes. So why don't we have lump sum taxes if lump sum taxes are superior? It's because in this analysis, we've simplified things greatly. We've only looked at one consumer. And it's true that if, if you just have one consumer or if you had a whole bunch of identical consumers, then lump sum taxes would be superior to specific taxes. But in the real world, we have people with many different incomes. They're not identical. Margaret Thatcher, when she was Prime Minister of Great Britain, actually suggested that Great Britain get rid of some of its other taxes and impose lump sum taxes instead. And you know the British parliamentary system means that the Prime Minister has a lot of power 
in most cases when the prime minister says something that is going to happen because they're the leader of the party that has the majority in parliament but the idea that that Britain's royalty should pay exactly the amount the same amount of money in taxes as the servants that they have was unpopular even among the members of parliament of Margaret Thatcher's conservative party now to be clear she wasn't suggesting that all the taxes that the British government imposed be switched to lump sum taxes she was just suggesting that a few of them be switched to lump sum taxes but still this was so unpopular that it caused riots to occur in British cities because people thought it was quite unfair that the poorest members of the society would be paying the same amount of this type of tax as the richest members. And the conservative members of parliament decided that it was such an unpopular position that they were going to lose the next election if they stuck with it. And Margaret Thatcher made it clear that she was going to stick to it, so they didn't stick with her. They voted her out of her leadership position and that's when she retired from politics. So in the real world with people of different incomes, lump sum taxes are have a characteristic of being unfair in the eyes of lots of people and so they're not imposed. So this analysis of the superiority of lump sum taxes works when you don't have any income distribution considerations. So it works best when you have a society where everybody's exa exactly the same. Or, for instance, when the government has decided, uh, Mr. XYZ, I'm going to take 50 bucks from you, how should I do it? So if you already know what your tax burden is, then you would prefer a lump sum tax to a specific tax. But modern governments never really impose taxes in that manner, and that's why this proof of the superiority of lump sum taxes uh, does not have a lot of relevance to real world taxation policies.